Just Fairies, the podcast about fairies. Today, we talk about an old lady who never forgave mistakes. A report by Karsten Watzek from the last visit of the fairy Theodore Hoyce in April 1997 before she set off on her final voyage to the Indian shipbreaking yard at Alang. She was a kindly old lady. In the last years of her existence, she was relatively quiet and unobtrusive, but blessed with exceptional pride and remarkable defiance. She had the sympathy of many. Even during her lifetime, she was a legend for those who knew her well. Her charm made even experienced seamen and veteran captains burst into rapture and sentimentality. And when it was finally over, politicians traveled from distant Bonn and dismissed her honorably. We are talking about the railway ferry Theodore Hoyce. 13 April 1997 was a rainy Sunday. Dark clouds lay over Rostock Vernemunda as we drove by car towards the old railway station. Apart from the aged facilities, there is nothing to indicate its former purpose. However, a veteran had returned and was lying in the old ferry berth at the moment, not to take passengers or cargo to Scandinavia, but to make the last journey to the Indian ship graveyard from here. Calm had returned after a few turbulent days. The Theodor Hoyce had long since ceased to be a German ship and had already been renamed Theodor. She spent her last hours in home waters. After it had been said several times in the previous few days that the ship was to set sail for India, it was now definitely sure on this Sunday. We stopped next to the blue hole of the ship. We could hear a chugging sound, and some crew members were rolling out hoses. We were the last visitors to the boat, and none of the men bothered us. We said a quick hello to a Brit before we stumbled sideways over the fenders of the jetty to the side pilot gate of the ship. Memories of old times inevitably came up, and so our visit became a journey into the past. In autumn 1955, the German Federal Railway, DB, decided to build a new railway, car, and passenger ferry for the krosenbroden kaigitsa line. The traffic volume could no longer handle, especially in the summer months. A new ferry was planned in consultation with the Danish State Railways, DSB. The Kiel-based Hovitzverka, HDW, received the order to build the ship, with the construction number 1067. It was built on Slipway 5 as a diesel-electric ferry. The main parameters were tailored to the existing ferry facilities. However, the length deviated from the previous ships to create improved stowage facilities for passenger train wagons on the railway deck. Three side-by-side -side tracks were installed, which converged in the bow gate area of the ferry. The hole above the car deck was made of aluminum alloy, the hole of Siemens Martin steel. Seams and joints were welded, while the superstructure was riveted smooth. Even almost 40 years later, rivets and welds were visible. Nothing has been changed by rebuilding since then. When I entered the railway deck through the side gate, I could picture the work that had been done here almost four decades ago. They were building a ship that would set new standards in terms of size and comfort, and engineers wrote pages and pages in magazines and newspapers about the ferry. So, there was plenty to talk about when, on 9 July 1957, the federal president's niece, Gabriela Wertz, performed the ceremonial naming of the ship, Theodor Hoys, the name of her uncle. Technically, the brand new ship offered some special features. In order to obtain optimal maneuvering characteristics, a rudder was installed in the bow area in addition to a so-called Voigt Schneider propeller. The main objective of the planning was to keep the ship steady rather than to move it sideways. Only later, when bow thrusters completely displaced the VSP from deep sea ferry construction, was transverse thrust the main objective. Finally, the diesel-electric propulsion system should be mentioned, which operated on four propeller motors, two each in tandem arrangement on one shaft. Eight direct current generators were driven by eight Maybach diesel engines of the MD655 series. These old Maybach diesel engines have survived 40 years. It's hard to believe, but they are not to be scrapped, but will continue to be used in an Indian power station. We wanted to see the captain and made our way to the upper decks, but the first damper approached in the form of the first officer. No photos, no videos, he said, pointing angrily at my camera. The Dutch captain was more open, although rather taciturn, he allowed us all our photo and video requests. The secrecy surrounding the Theodore Hoyce had increased in recent weeks. 
After demanding that the ship be preserved as a museum and several interested parties came forward, the shipping company DFO started to get a little closer. And when even the North German Broadcasting, NDR, showed up on board with the television crew, they said, please, no press announcements about the future of the ship for the time being. Nobody knew or wanted to say how to proceed with the old ferry. And when the preservation efforts failed, and the Hamburg company Eckert Marine bought the Theodor Heuss for $750,000, all doors were closed. It took a great deal of effort to archive it on celluloid. In 1957, of course, things were completely different. At the time, the Theodor Heuss was considered the nation's pride. It was the flagship of the German Federal Railways, and on its maiden voyage on 14 November 1957, it hosted Federal President Theodor Heuss. The Snow White Ferry set sail under Captain Heinemann. Radio and television reported in great detail that the president announced that his ancestors had been skippers on the River Rhine. Zehn D-Zugwagen, 80 Personenautos und 1500 Passagiere kann das neue Fährschiff der Bundesbahn befördern, das in Gegenwart des Bundespräsidenten eingeweiht wurde. Professor Heuss war Ehrengast auf der Jungfernfahrt des Schiffes, das seinen Namen trägt und das zwischen Großen Brode und Dänemark verkehrt. From then on, the 135.9 meter long Theodor Heuss transported train wagons, road vehicles, and passengers between Germany and Denmark every day. New ramps had to be built in the ports, especially for the new ship, as it had a separate car deck. 1,500 passengers found space and could enjoy the crossing in different classes, salons, restaurants, and even a hairdressing salon for ladies and gentlemen. The wood-paneled walls in the passenger deck were preserved, as were plastic ornaments and carpeting. In 1976, the DB created a self-service market in the rear area. They removed the customs and passport clearance and installed a cafeteria. Time had stood still here. Associations from the daily ferry service awaited us in almost every part of the ship. Neon tubes flickered in some display cases and illuminated old posters of the German Federal Railway. Exit Rugby was written over paper on an outer gate, and a wall clock from the 50s showed the exact time. Theodor Heuss served the Grossenbrode Getzer line until 1963, the opening of the new Puttgarden Rugby crossing. Long years of service followed without any difficulties. In 1969, the ferry collided with the eastern breakwater in Puttgarden in a storm. But otherwise, there was not much negative to report from this vessel. The last few years, we took a bit of a risk, reported Captain Peter Mueller. We knew that the machines were no longer young. Day and night, colleagues worked in the engine rooms to keep everything running. And it did run. The Theodore Hoist became a guarantee for reliability and punctuality. As we strolled across the deck, I noticed the missing benches. Once, there were several rows on the boat deck. Now, there was an open area. No one would sit here anymore. No passenger. There was only us, the last people attached to the ship. And when we entered the bridge, I saw Captain Gunnar Sorensen in front of my eyes, whom I had seen in action here just six months ago at the two engine telegraphs. In fact, the Theodor Hoyce was in full service for the shipping company DFO until the day of her decommissioning on 6 April 1997 at 6.10 a.m. In 1972, the Theodor Heuss got a new colleague. Deutschland was the new ferry's name, which had a new outfit and replaced its predecessor of the same name. And a little later, the white paint of the Theodor Heuss also disappeared under the blue color scheme that had existed until then. As the last noticeable external change, the ship received two large ventilators behind the funnel at the beginning of the 1980s to make the necessary air exchange for dangerous goods possible. In the saloon, we met the first officer again. Here, where passengers used to enjoy the rich Scandinavian buffet, the crew had set up their mess. Freezers stood lashed to the wall, and pop music played from the loudspeakers. In 1963, this salon could even be admired in the cinema. In Kurt Tchalski's movie version of Grip's Home Castle, the filmmakers chose the Theodor Heuss in a five-minute sequence. Abfahrt 9.15 Uhr. 
Das Meer, Becky. Warum sehen wir das so gerne? Weil es Größe hat. Wer hat das schon? Es regt mich auf, Daddy. Und ich muss gleich was dagegen tun. Ich gehe zum Kapitän. Komm, Daddy. Lydia. Aber was willst du beim Kapitän? Es ist meine erste Seereise, Peter. Darüber wird er sich freuen. Aber er weiß es ja nicht. Du kannst doch nicht einfach zum Kapitän gehen. Du meinst, er weiß mich von Bord? Lydia! Lydia! Sind Sie der Kapitän? Nein. Aber Sie werden es sicher einmal, so wie er aussieht. Ach, schönen Dank, aber wollten Sie etwas vom Kapitän? Ich wollte immer mal gerne auf einer Kommandobrücke stehen. Wissen Sie, als ich jung war... Was sind Sie denn jetzt? ...wollte ich Kapitän werden. Ich verstehe. Die Seefahrt hat eine alte Verpflichtung Ihnen gegenüber. Bitte. Dankeschön. Komm, Peter. Entschuldigen Sie bitte, das ist mir sehr unangenehm, danke. Guten Tag, guten Tag. Oh. Und du schreibst nur, Peter? Weiß er, wohin er fährt? Wir haben es ihm vorher gesagt. <lacht> Darf ich mal? Nehmen Sie Mädchen nicht? Nicht dafür. Wir kommen sonst nach Liverpool. Und bringen die Leute unnötig in Verwirrung. Dankeschön. Danke. Bitte? Dankeschön. Ich danke auch. It is hard to believe that there were 34 long years between the movie and 13 April 1997. The idea of decommissioning the ship first arose in the 80s. The new ferry, Carl Karstens, came into service in 1986 and was supposed to replace the 30-year-old Theodore Hoyce. But freight traffic increased, and so the DB decided to keep the veteran in service. There was no reason to sell it. At the time, there was no thought of adding another 11 years but it sailed on and on. In 1993, the ferry was transferred to the new shipping company, DFO. The old DB logo on the funnel was burnt off, but otherwise, the ferry remained in service. At the end of her service, shipping enthusiasts began to think about preserving her as a museum, but to the great disappointment of all, the ship was sold to Alang in India. I would have preferred if the Theodore Hoist had become a museum. I can't imagine the scrapping of the ship. It is sad, said Captain Peter Kopecki in conclusion, and Captain Sorensen also had to state that he did not want to take part in a transfer trip to the Far East. That would not be for me, and I couldn't do it. A farewell party with a music group brought many old sailors together again. The DFO had invited everyone to a farewell party immediately after the ship was decommissioned. Old memories came up once again. She had been difficult to drive, said one of the senior captains. She was sweet, but she never forgave mistakes, added another captain, and Captain Werner Reinhold, who sailed on the Theodor Hoist for more than 30 years, told with shining eyes how he almost asked, Old lady, take me to the harbor again. I promise not to make a mistake either. All of them were long gone that Sunday. We met the superintendent of the Dutch transfer company, and I gave him four photos of the old vessel but he was even more interested in the speed and performance diagrams from 1957 that I had brought with me. He almost effusively noted that the documents could be of considerable help to the captain and the chief. Another employee quickly joined him, and a discussion broke out. These are the diagrams and curves we've been missing. See, he said, letting me feel his enthusiasm for technology. This curve here shows exactly how we can and want to drive. Departure was approaching. For us, the chapter Theodor Hoys was now also coming to an end. Together, we left the old ferry. Once again, the handlers thanked us for the performance curves and referred to their request to take photos of the trip and record everything in detail. Punctually, as if it was a matter of keeping to a timetable, the engine started at around 4.30 p.m. Smoke billowed out of the funnel. Kingstown was written in large letters on the tailgate as the new home port. Very slowly, the ship slid out of the ferry berth. Since no one knew precisely when Theodore was leaving, 
We were the only ones with our cameras and video cameras pointed at the ship. After 10 minutes, it was over. Theodore turned off Vandemunda and steamed north. After bunkering off Vliesingen, Suez, and Aden, she arrived in India at the end of May 1997. Scrapping began, and soon the old ship was gone. That was the end of an era. This was the Just Fairies podcast about the last visit to the Theodore Hoist. If you would like to learn more about fairies, please visit justfairies.de.